wake up. Hello. Welcome to Tips and Tricks for New Add-on Creators. Uh, has anybody in here actually already made an add-on? Okay, thank goodness, because this is for you. This is, not, this is not like a beginner, beginner, beginner. We're going to go through anything like that. Can I make that big? We're going we're gonna to go with that. All right. Well, cool. So who am I? My name is Zach Eason. I'm here. Uh, this is my first time at Blender Conference. Having a great time. Uh, what have I done? I started in Blender in 2008 and Blender 2.47 with uh, Big Buck Bunny uh, back in high school. It was, a, it was a great time. And I used it throughout high school. I used it throughout uh, college um, and then professionally for seven years now and running my own business here with uh, my fellow, fellow comrade uh, Richard Trainer. And we have started TruVFX and we're out in developers. Uh, like I said, TrueVFX, we do stuff like TrueTerrain, Nodescapes, TrueSky, TrueBDB, TrueSpace, plenty of beautiful add-ons. Um, so, so then, that's who I am. Who is this for? Uh, this is for add-on creators who have, made, have already made maybe one, maybe two small or just like automated, automation scripts or add-ons and are looking to ramp up their skills. If you're an advanced coder in here, great. I hope you learned something, but it might not be the greatest. But we're, we're, things we're not going to discuss in here, uh, we're not going to discuss exactly setting up a new add-on, and we're not going to be going through the actual API itself. There's going to be a little bit of script talk. We're going to have a couple uh, verbal uh, tutorials uh, later on, and we'll go through, I guess technically we'll go through the API there, but we're not going to go like line by line, how do you find stuff. Um, Love to go through th these things. Come up and talk to me if you think that would be like really beneficial. Trying to go through some of these things in the future, um, but there's a lot of already uh, beginning developer ones, and so I, this is this is really what if um, when I started coding in Blender, what would, it's kind of like my letter back to myself about what would I have loved right after that first add-on. Okay, now I want to make it. I want to make it pretty. I want to make it more usable. I want to make it uh, faster or something like that. This is my this is my letter back to myself on advice on how to just make that better. So I hope you want to grip. So group one, uh, helping coders how to find help for the Blender API. First thing first, the best thing a developer has is somebody else. That's your best friend is somebody else, right? And so, and the number one thing is always Google. And so how do you Google a Blender Python related question? Because sometimes a lot of this, the, the, the terminology is, is similar to JavaScript, it's similar to Python, just Python in general, other C, C++. How do you find an actual Blender thing? And, and right there, start every search with BPY. I, I, it, will, it, it changes the game, it really does. You'll, you'll get specifically to Blender Python things. So first and foremost, always Google your question and always start it with BPY. If you start with Blender, you're gonna most likely get, like even if you get, um, even if you get like the documentation from Blender itself, it'll be the user manual from like the UI and as an actual animator side of things. But if you do BPY, more often than not, you're gonna get the actual uh, API documentation. Number two, there are, and I assume if you've done any sort of Googling search, you're gonna find these two places. There is two fantastic places to go for um, questions. If you wanna ask a question, but more often than not, you already, the question's already been answered, and that is Blender, for Blender Artists and um, Blender Stack Exchange. These are the two number one places you're gonna find. Honestly, when Googling, you're gonna, they're gonna come up anyways. You almost don't even have to go to it directly to find your stuff. You're gonna find it by just by Googling. Um, Third one is the Blender API tutorials. And there's multiple things. This is kind of more of a heading. Um, and so some of the things inside the Blender API tutorials are things like uh, the Blender release notes. When Blender releases a new version, there's, a, there's an actual uh, category for Python and text editor. And inside that, they will release all the Python changes that they do. And sometimes even within that, uh, they will actually show you how to use the new feature. Uh, I think the most recent one that I found was um, uh, they added search to string properties, which I was like, oh, that's a fantastic use. I have plenty of things I could do that with. And so uh, just reading the release notes in that way will, it will keep you up to date and it sometimes will help you find how to use the new stuff. Uh, second one there is the actual docs.blender.org slash API current. Surprise, the docs are very good. And inside those docs, well, most of the time they're really good. There's a lot of really great stuff in there. And uh, one of the things in there is the actual how, you, um, how to use many of the things. Like if you go to the operator section, it's gonna give you uh, a, a template or a example after example after example how to do uh, multiple different things. Um, text editor templates. Uh, the text, inside the text editor there's a template section and, and there's lots of actual text templates inside there for very common uh, how to do a simple operator, how to do a simple panel, how to do a new node tree, how to do a new node, like very, very cool stuff. Um, 
And then, and there's, and then, so that's all kind of blender stuff. But then there's, there's a couple, there's other places. These are the two that I have gone to the most, synesthesia.co. Uh, that is the creator of Mirage and, uh, there's another one, I forget what it is. Um, uh, oh, Render Plus, that's what it is. He's the creator of that. And he has very good detailed templates um, or articles explaining how to do, how to get really deep into stuff like UI lists and a, a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, I, I will note that uh, if it's not posted in the description of this YouTube video, I will post the link to this, this slides thing. So if you're trying to take notes, you're like, holy cow, he's going so fast. Um, uh, I apologize. Oh, and the last one right there is uh, JNM, I think is how you pronounce it. Fantastic YouTuber. He has just Blender tutorials in general, uh, but he also does uh, a lot of uh, uh, coding ones, specifically OpenGL. And that one, that's really nice if you're trying to do custom UI or you want to do your own custom uh, uh, gizmo that doesn't involve a Blender's gizmo, stuff like that. Um, Oh, and, and that uh, I've put QR codes, hopefully relatively to what we're talking about. So if you're finding this online afterwards or you're doing it right now, you can easily get that QR code later on and go to their site. Uh, so after, another great place to find someone else who's your best friend or is in real chats, IRL. Uh, we have, so Iadabed, that's not how you pronounce it, I apologize. Uh, he has a, a Discord called BPY, fantastic, very active. He himself is very active, but there's also plenty of other people on there that are very active. Uh, you get on there, you ask a question, you go to the relevant channel and you ask a question. It's gonna be very good, I've used it multiple times, it's fantastic. Uh, then there's also, of course, the, the official Blender chat. Um, and I've put two on here, there's the specific one to Python, but then I have a, a general link that lists all the chats because there's, there's a bunch of different chats on there. And that's another one in real time. You can communicate with other people. Sometimes developers get on there and they can help out and stuff like that. So in real chats, you can ask your questions. You don't have to go to a forum and wait three days and hope somebody has uh, clicks on your stuff and goes through that. So yeah. And then, of course, the relevant QR codes. Uh, these are some GitHub repositories. Uh, the first two I actually haven't used, but I looked look through there real quickly, and they have very good examples of how to do some pretty common stuff uh, inside the Blender Path and API. Iadmed, that's the guy who uh, who did the BPY Discord. He again, uh, he has a, a repository again of very great templates and great examples of how to do some complicated stuff like ray casting and stuff like that. Uh, Easy BPY by Curtis Holt. I, I don't know if, how many of you guys know, actually know Curtis Holt uh, or watch his stuff, but he has this. He has this it's almost like a Python library, effectively, that you download and uh, you can use in your stuff. And what he does, his is more about if you're learning the Blender API in general. Um, and, and you can call these very easy things like get object. And it'll just, it'll, it'll just get the object really quick. So there's some really nice, easy ways to get into coding or to find a way of doing it. Because you can even just explore Curtis Holt's um, operators and functions and stuff like that to see actually how he's doing what he's doing. Next section, coding helpers. So actually, while you're coding, some helpers for this. Uh, first thing is things inside Blender. If you're going to do any sort of um, work inside Blender, the best thing, of course, is to, uh, in your user preferences, go to the interface and enable developer extras and Python tooltips. This will allow you to see kind of the guts of Blender. It will also allow you to, it will also um, bring up new menu options in the right-click menu, such as copy Python command, copy Python um, data, data, um, RNA, I don't know, there's a couple of things. And you can actually get whether it's the, the button operator that, that what it's using or the actual property. That's what I was looking for either, the property that they use on there. Uh, oh, also, you can right click on many things and, it'll, and there's an online Python um, uh, reference and it'll take you to the website, the, the, the documentation for that exact property. It's really nice. Python tooltips that will actually show you uh, what the property or um, operator is, gonna, uh, it is since you can copy and see and all that sort of stuff. Um, the next one is uh, go into prefs editing text editor. If you're going to do any dis um, uh, scripting in the text editor, uh, you know if you like the auto close pair, so if brackets, parentheses, curly brackets, it'll automatically close it for you. You don't have to do it. Though if you're used to closing it, I've recently turned I turned this on since 3.3, which is when it was introduced, I believe. 3.1, apologies. Um, and I still add my extra one, and so then I have errors because I always have too many parentheses and that sort of stuff. So be careful. Um, Fake BPY module. I think this is one of the most important ones if you have an IDE or something like that. Like I use VS Code and I'm gonna, the next slide I believe is, uh, gives you, is going to do some specific things to VS Code. Um, but this, uh, the fake BPY module which you install almost like it's an actual Python library. Uh, but this actually will enable your IDE to, or IntelliSense um, to fill in uh, the actual stuff. You type BPY in period, it'll, it'll let's out data, context. It'll give you all those options like in the uh, Blender 
um, a Python editor uh, there, or console. Uh, and so it does a lot of stuff like that, which is really nice. And so that's how you install it uh, in the command line or anything like that. But then there's, you can just Google Python. Um, so, and then where it says version, so you, normal way you do it is uh, in fake BPY module latest, and that just does the latest Blender version that they have available, which they're, they're very fast. They usually have it immediately. Um, or if you want a specific version, after instead of latest, you actually put 4.3, no, no brackets or anything like that. Um, that 4.3 is not a Blender version, so I don't, you shouldn't probably do that. <laughs> All right, uh, so VS Code, like I said. So there are some VS Code extensions I would highly recommend. And if you're doing, um, doing multi-file uh, Blender add-ons, uh, I would incredibly ad advise you use VS Code for one, uh, for one extension and one extension alone, and that is the, the Blender development extension. Um, and it has a bunch of functions, a bunch of snippets, and stuff like that for developing add-ons and scripts. So it, it was created by actually Jacques Luc, who's now the developer for uh, Geometry Nodes. Uh, he's no longer maintaining it, so if anybody knows anybody who's really good at, at, at Blender and JavaScript, because uh, most of it inside uh, it's, it's JavaScript inside VS Code a lot of times. Uh, you should definitely get on that because it, 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 there's some updates that could be really nice. Um, uh, so it's developed by it, but he's not developing anymore. Uh, so the, the best one is, is a, uh, there, sorry, there's a, there you can do a new add-on right from the visual code, like um, uh, key map stuff like that. So you automatically create a new add-on, create a new file, you can name it, it'll set up all your uh, appropriate uh, file structure, it'll put in the right way. Um, and then, and then this is my favorite feature, is re, it'll reload your multi-file add-on every time you save it. So you don't have to press F8, you don't have to, if, especially if you're using a multi-file add-on, you actually usually have to close Blender and open it after every change just because it doesn't register. There's some, uh, Sebrin has a talk like this from I think 2019 uh, where he, he actually goes through how you do that like in Python and I, I could never get to work. And so VS Code does it for me and it's fantastic. And you just save it and it, will, it automatically reloads Blender. Uh, it doesn't close or anything that just reloads it and, 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 there. and it also it, it implements debugging inside VS Code, which is a live sync because you, um, you can do log points and break points and all sorts, you can pause your functions and actually see it line by line. Uh, a lot of really nice stuff inside that. Uh, you also are able to keep your add-on outside of the add-ons folder and it will automatically create a uh, symbolic link folder into the add-ons thing. And, um, and so that, what I like about that is that True Terrain uh, has gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of assets and stuff like that. And so every time I, I, I run it through VS Code, I'm not copying an entire add-on, you know, uh, like 100 gigabytes over to the next version of Blender. It just does a symbolic link. So that's just really nice. But then that, that's what actually allows you to keep it outside of Blender. So you don't accidentally delete it when you delete Blender or uninstall Blender or anything like that. Um, and then you can also actually do uh, script updates, like script updates as though you were in, writing inside the text editor and hitting the play button. You can actually do that inside VS Code and you have all VS Code's nice things, like the text editor doesn't has IntelliSense. It doesn't give you the, um, the, the, what's next when you hit period, anything like that, but VS Code does. So you can actually do that inside of uh, VS Code as well. Next one, uh, that, that's really nice, Blender Python code templates. This one will, with, by just typing like operator, it'll give you basically the exact same thing if you went into Blender text editor, did a new templates operator, a simple operator, it'll, and you can copy that and paste that into your code. So it's a lot of nice um, snippets for creating menus, operators, it'll even, it even has like a thing for the register function, so it'll just automatically put def reg and all that sort of stuff. It's really nice. Um, cause I don't remember how to do all this stuff, especially those like those things you have to do to actually register the BLID name. I never remember. And so I just don't have to, I just type operator and it does it all for me. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, oh no, no, that's right. Uh, sorcery. Okay. So this one's a little, it, it does cost money though. Um, if you are doing this professionally, I would highly recommend it. There is a free version and it has limited cap capability, but basically what sorcery does is it says, you know, this is not the most optimized way of doing this in, Blint, uh, in, in Python. Uh, as you see here at, in the, inside the GIF, it has a for loop, then an if, and then you basically append it to this list and it will say, Hey, why don't you just turn this to a li list comprehension and it'll do it all for you. It's, it's, it's incredibly nice. And it's if nothing else. It's taught me to be a better Python, uh, user. Now, the only problem, of course, with sorcery is that their assumptions, these are, these are better practices that maybe you don't agree with or your business doesn't agree with. So that's the only difficulty with um, sorcery. But as the owner of my own thing, it doesn't matter. So I, I can use it. And it's really great. And it just uh, helps me do, because list comprehensions and a lot of those sort of things, uh, comprehensions in general or generators in general are going to be much faster than if you just actually write out each thing inside Python. 
Um, the next one is auto doctoring. This is just really good for making sure you keep your information straight and you actually know what your own functions do in the future. <laughs> Those have been some of my biggest problems is I write these giant ones. I never do a doc stream because it's too complicated. And it, what's nice about doctoring too is you actually state which uh, what type, what format type? Do you want to use NumPy? Do you want to, I forget the other ones. I use NumPy, uh, NumPy's version of doc string formatting. And it just keeps it consistent. And it automatically does some fancy formatting thing. And I think it's marked down and whatnot inside it. And it's, it's very nice. Very, very nice. Uh, the last one that I would recommend, and it's because I just, I figured out I'm a bad speller. And I got tired of people telling me that I misspelled something, is Code Speller Checker. Um, and, and so this one is actually a, check, a spell checker for VS Code, and, and it will even do programming words. Now I'm going to give you a, a quick thing to actually um, uh, get it, so it doesn't actually uh, try to spell check your, your variables and stuff like that. So in uh, VS Code, uh, if you hit Control Shift P, and then you hit you type in user JSON, it should pop up immediately. Uh, and then inside user JSON, uh, you're going to find the other C spell settings, and then type. Uh, type basically this over to the right here, or my, yep, yep, you're right. And you type that, and I've, I've in comments, I've said which one it does what. So this one will, by, by including this in your VS Code settings, um, you will, uh, it won't spell check all your random uh, lettered variables and other things like that. It will only do comments, doc strings, and strings. That's what I have mine for, because uh, those are usually the most uh, visible to other people. And so, really nice. Make sure I, I have. Uh, I found a lot of a lot of misspellings because of this. Ones I didn't. I did No one even told me about. All right, next version. We're going fast. I hope it's okay. Um, so this is the next session is something that I I, I didn't. I mean, I think as soon as you're a developer of any kind, you're going to start realizing that the BPY.ops section is super useful until you need something from it. You need it to return something. Or until you butt up against the whole, like, oh, the, the poll function failed. And like, okay, but why? You know, like, what, what is going on here? And so uh, I'm, I'm titling this high versus low API. Um, and so high API, I'm, I'm, I'm defining as the BPY.ops uh, operators. And the low level is the stuff like bpy.context.object, stuff like that. Um, so many Blender uh, development add-ons tell you actually to do this. They tell you, right, it's fantastic. The, the best way to get into Blender coding is to right-click on an operator th that you want to do and then paste it into your Python file, right? Uh, you want to create 10 cubes, write a for loop with a range of uh, a, a nine, and then, and then do the bpy.ops.mesh.create primitive cube or something, whatever it is, and it'll create 10 of them. Like, e e super fast, super great for automation. But once you actually need those cubes and need to do something with it, it's, it's incredibly difficult and you, and you have to do a lot of workarounds. And sometimes it's necessary. Um, but let's talk real quick, because this is one of the things I had the hardest problem of trying to figure out to do, is when do you use the high level versus when's the best way to use the low level? Oh, sorry, I'm going to have myself to some degree. This is, <laughs> right, th th these are the advantages of both, right? So the advantages of the BPY, the high level, is that you write one line of code, and that's it. And maybe some other lines to, to make it, like, look nice and, and whatnot for the operators. But, but if you needed to do anything with that, it's not, it, 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 you can't, the, you don't, have, you have to find uh, the plane uh, afterwards, and that's sometimes that's difficult. Um, create plane low level, uh, the low level code, right? This is actually how you would create uh, the, a plane in the low level. Um, and it's a lot more. It's a lot more verbose. It takes a lot more lines of code. But you notice here we already have the mesh data. We have the object data. We've actually already named it. Now, of course, Blender does their unique thing where they'll put dot zero zero one or whatever afterward. But you don't, even if you, after you name it, even if they do make it unique, you have the, it already in a variable. You don't have to go finding for it. Um, you can tell what context it's in. You can actually do a lot of stuff with BMesh. This is a little more complicated because you, and usually you need BMesh, unfortunately, to do some of the stuff anymore inside of, to create a, a plane or something like that. Um, so, so advantages of high level, it's, it's, it's done. You don't have to really worry about it. It's one line of code. Low level, uh, advantages is you have it all at your hands. You don't have to go try to find, you don't have to do any workarounds to go and find it. All right, now, when do you use both, right? Um, so, when do you use high level API? Uh, so it, when it's too complicated to, to do on your own. So some examples of this are uh, to get the object or node under the mouse, under UV unwrapping. Oh, and went too far. Okay, that, my little preview is very small. I can't actually tell what's next. <laughs> um, so like if you're wanting to get an object, uh, you could cast a ray and then try to figure out if that ray intersects the obj any objects. And you know there's a, there's a lot of complicated stuff there to just select an object when you could just do bpy.ops that select or something like that and then and then figure out by bpy.context.object you get it, right? Easy peasy. Um, or nodes, you can't even do a there's not a ray cast in nodes. I even confirmed this with um, uh, 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 
Jacques, is that it, it loops through every node in your node editor, calculates the bounding box, and figures out if your uh, mouse coordinates are inside of that. So those things like that, you wouldn't want to use that for. That's complicated. It's not necessary. The workarounds are useful in that um, in that in that, in that area. And so if you don't need anything returned, that's also a really beneficial way. If you know, you know, an example of that is uh, deleting the selected object. I don't know why you would do this, but you could use this inside your thing. You don't need that object afterward because it's non-existent. Um, or adding a primitive and not eating it afterwards. Or once again, UV unwrapping. UV unwrapping is a big one. I, I used to do that. I tried to do that once, and it's just best to <laughs> let the Blender uh, operator one try to do that on its own. Um, so stuff where you don't need it afterward. You don't need the UV unwrap information afterwards. You're going to get it anyway just because uh, you have to. That's the only way you can get it is going and getting it afterwards in like BMesh or something like that. Um, if you can't find a low level API, not everything has a lower level API. Uh, rendering, baking, uh, I mean all these things uh, don't have an actual lower level equivalent or at least not that I know of. So you, sometimes you just have to. You just have to work around the pull, pull uh, functions and whatnot in order to get it. Um, yeah, open a new Blender window slash area, or if you're another add-ons function, if you want to include for some reason, the, or your own add-on function potentially, you're going to have to call the operator, and though usually you should know the pull function if you're going to do that one. Um, and, the, and the last one is too slow, right? Python is, relatively speaking, a slower language. Incredibly fast, faster than you or I can do anything, uh, but it's relatively fast. So. It, um, uh, but if you're iterating over a bunch of data, Python will always be slower than doing it in C or C++. So again, uh, do I have, I don't have it on there, but again, UV unwrapping would be another example of this. You're not going to want to, uh, especially if you have a high resolution mesh or something like that, if you're gonna, you don't want to loop over that, uh, that, that mesh and try to UV unwrap it and, and, and develop it unless you're doing something completely different. If you're just trying to automate something, uh, it, usually it's best to let it do it if it's going to be an iterator in that way. Um, all right, so when do you use the low-level API? Uh, so 90, 90, what did I say? 95% of the rest of your code should be really um, uh, the low-level API. It's a lot easier to work with, I find, and it's more predictable. Um, so if you're using an operator in an area that it wasn't intended to be, like if you're trying to delete an object from the node editor, there's going to be a pull problem because it doesn't, it's not going to be able to get the context of that object because the context is very different. There's no context that object. There's only context that node. Um, so stuff like that getting uh, or around, uh, that's going to have a problem. You have to actually find uh, the, the, the right context and stuff like that, and, and the deleting the object I don't think would work. Um, right, if speed is your key, and now we're talking relatively speaking, but doing, if speed is your key in, uh, did I give an example of this? Yeah, um, so, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, it's been a little bit. Um, so a lot, of, like, like we talked about, operators have a lot of extra code, i.e. pull functions, but not I mean just pull functions, like the create a, a cube thing has the ability to uh, do transform data, uh, has the ability to do UV unwrapping, all included in that. You may not need that, but the operator is doing it anyways. And so if, you, if you're you know, creating a thousand cubes, um, you're doing all these, uh, all, these, uh, uh, all these things that you don't need automatically. And every time you call the, the operator, it's also doing that poll check. So you may have, you may have fix the poll check, but every time you call that operator, it's going to recall that if statement, which, I mean, if statements are relatively speaking, but if, if we're creating thousands of cubes, it's going to be, it's going to be a problem. Um, is there anything else I listed on here? Yeah, that's exactly what I said. So, all right, let's actually go into some code examples. I'm doing good on time. I have one very short one. It's one slide, and I have one very long one. It's Multiple slides. <laughs> uh, so we're going to go through two things. We're going to go through installing a blend, uh, 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 an external uh, Python library, um, and then we're also going to go through a nice visual uh, way of doing what is it called? Um, progress bars. That's what it is. So, so first one: uh, How do you actually install external modules that are not included with Blender? Import sys. Import subprocess. Sys.executable. That's the Blender file that 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 your, blend, your current. That's the Python file that your current Blender file is using. Um, and then you call a subprocess.call, and you put those arguments. First, first here, what we're doing, we're making sure that pip is installed, because most of your users probably haven't done anything with Python. Um, and so ensure pip is something that's included with Blender, just in case pip is not installed. Uh, and you do that in user means it's going to do it for the actual user. Sometimes that, uh, that's also needed for some permission issues. Upgrade, make sure that pip is going to be upgraded. 
it's sometimes. Um, and then default pit is, is kind of something that's necessary. Uh, and then we do if process that call args equals arguments. Um, and if this if statement makes sure that if, if ensure pip does not actually install pip, it, it does not try to then install anything else. So if, it, if, if pip is not installed, then it, uh, then it returns. Though this is not a function, so it, it wouldn't actually, this would throw an error. Um, and then we go move on to effectively the same thing uh, for the actual Python library you want. And then at the end, there is the library name. That's what you would actually want to do. If you wanted to install it, so adding dash dash user will also place it inside your user's Python site packages folder, which is in the, it's similar to, it, it's, it's the Python library just, just for the user. Um, and when it does that, um, it allows other Blender versions to use the same Python library, or sometimes it might be already installed because it's something else that uses Python is, is wanting to use it, or another add-on or something like that. Um, and so that's very useful. However, if you don't want to, for whatever reason, install it in the user, you, you feel a little bit iffy about that or whatnot, you can also, uh, down here, instead of user, you would do dash t equals and then your target, target directory where you want to. Like, one of the good ways to put it is, um, is, in the, is in a folder called module, or modules that would be next to add-on. Sometimes you have to actually add it in the um, in the Blender uh, folder uh, structure. Um, but that's a good way to do it because Blender will also automatically check in a folder if that's there um, uh, for those modules and include it in it. If you do it anywhere else, you're going to have to actually include it in the path, and it's it's very complicated. Would not recommend using that. Um, all right, so that is installing modules uh, that are external to, uh, or, or Python libraries that are not included with Blender or the normal Python library set. Um, so progress bars. So the way I found to do best progress bars, uh, Blender has a, uh, a window manager thing for progress bars. It's a little countdown. It's very small numbers. And it, it, is it great? Yes. Is it wonderful they've given us something? I, 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 yes, it's fantastic. But we all want the render or baking little uh, slider button, right? And how the heck do we do that? I try to do this forever. And because you, once you start an operator, uh, it's going to pause, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to freeze all of Blender. Um, and so what we're going to do, I'm going to show, we're going to go through. We got 13 minutes. I think we got some time. No, sorry, we have 23 minutes. Um, is that we're going to actually do a modal with a timer inside Blender. Um, and we're and so we're going to have two threads. One thread is actually what Blender and its UI is rendering or is using. Um, the other thread is what actually runs what we want to do. And then this thread reports progress back to this and update. And then and then the, inside the actual modal thing, as you'll see, it actually updates the UI and stuff like that. Um, uh, oh, and there's the worker thread. It actually does all the work and reports back. So we're going to start. I have a GIF here just to, I don't know. This is the templates. If you, don't, if you haven't worked at the templates and the uh, uh, text editor, fantastic. Uh, it's fantastic. So you're gonna, we're going to start with the, the modal operator timer template. And we're going to go based off of that so we don't have to start from scratch. Uh, and we do want the timer version of the modal operator template because without the timer, the UI will only update generally when the mouse is moved or when an event actually is triggered. So if you hit a, if a keyboard press or a mouse movement or mouse press, that's the only time your modal will actually, your modal function will actually run. Um, and so we would definitely want the timer one because the timer will actually, it will fire this modal operator every, we're going we're gonna to do a tenth of a second, but however, however long you put it in. All right. This is where hopefully it doesn't get too dense, um, and hopefully I don't speak too fast because I just want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So we're going to start with the register function. We're going to register in the text editor just because, I don't know, as, when I was making this, I thought that was easier to do. We were able to uh, see it actually in the uh, text editor. So we're going we're to register two properties in the text editor. The actual progress bar, which is just an int property that we're going to advance, uh, set to percentage so it, you, it, it shows a percent sign. And then show progress bar, which is just a Boolean that, that shows or that we'll, we'll do in a, a menu function actually shows or uh, hides the actual progress bar itself. Uh, we're going to register our modal class, which we haven't built yet but we will, and then we're going to actually append to the header uh, where it says like file and stuff like that, our actual menu function that will show or hide the um, progress bar. And then, we and then we unregister all that. So just make sure you see that. Um, uh, we're going to first then talk about the, where we have some variables inside the modal operator, how many cubes we're going to actually end up creating, how many cubes we've actually created, which was the one we'll actually update. Uh, updated, this is good for our modal function. It's not really useful for the one I've built, but it's a good practice to, so that way your modal function only does math if it needs to. Well, you, again, you'll see. End early, which will cancel the, the other thread 
Um, and then this is our thread, so we can make we can do we can do some checks while we're in the, the modal operator. Then we actually are going to do this is the worker function. This is the function that we're going to pass to a separate thread, and we're exactly doing all our work. You see, we're doing we're basically we're doing a while loop. We're making sure that the cubes created it doesn't equal the total cubes, or is still lesser than. Um, and then we have effectively the same uh, mesh uh, creation script. This time it's a cube instead of a grid or a plane. Um, and uh, that we did have before. And then down and below, we have uh, the, we're, gonna, we're actually updating all of these. So it's self.cubesCreated plus equals one, self.updated equals true, and then, self, and then we're checking if this has, if anything has set this to end early, and if so, return it, and that will kill the thread if it actually ends early. Good, we're busting through this. All right, this is the actually, you know, execute function. This is what will most likely, unless you have an invoke function, this is what will actually be called first. You can also do this invoke, it doesn't have to be execute. Um, so we gain the uh, window uh, manager. We're setting up our timer. 0 0.1 is a tenth of a second, uh, telling it where to go, uh, what actually window to do. Um, and then we're adding uh, this operator to the, the, hand, the modal operator, uh, modal handler, sorry. And then here is threading.thread target equals self.cubes, which is that function we just talked about. Uh, and we know so we're passing it without the parentheses, right? We're passing it as a callback. And then for this one, we don't have any arguments, but inside the parentheses is where you would put the arguments. Um, if you only have one argument, make sure to put a comma or else it will throw an error. And so remember, threading that thread, these are threads, not processes. Um, and so you're still running on the same core as Blender. And so if you're doing very intensive, CPU intensive stuff, the Blender uh, UI will still update, but it will be, it'll be laggy because you're on the same core because Blender does, right now doesn't so like uh, multi-processing. So it's the same thread which will allow you to update your user uh, for, for progress bars and stuff like that, um, but it will be uh, a little bit buggy. And if you wanna know about threading, there's lots of YouTube videos. Okay, um, we're just getting this, we're making sure that we're showing the, the actual progress bar because we're starting everything, making sure our progress bar integer is set to zero because sometimes if they run it multiple times, sometimes it's not always reset. I don't know why that is. Maybe someone else does, but that's fine. Um, and then we're actually telling the thread, the thread's not started up here. The thread is started right here where we, surprise, say start. Um, and then returning running modal. Uh, and that will actually then make sure to uh, make sure it knows that we're calling the modal, and it will it, it will add uh, it'll make sure that it's actually added to the stack and stuff like that. It's not a stack, but it's kind of like a stack. Um, now here is where the actual modal happens. So every time the timer uh, is fired, or a user moves the mouse, or does interacts with Blender in kind of just any way, this function itself is what's actually called. So you see right here at the beginning, we're uh, we're we're tagging the area to redraw to make sure. That was pretty. To make sure that um, that that uh, that the, our, our it actually shows that our progress bar is updated, uh, we see here we're checking if, if the user wants to, as in Blender fashion, if they hit escape, we were actually going to set self that end early equals true, and that will next time that the the create cubes actually gets to that bottom line, it will see that's true, and it will end the thread, and then down here you'll see that we actually check, we'll get there, um, and then we call self that finish, which we haven't talked about, um, and it, you just kind of tidy some things up, returns canceled. Um, here's where we actually are doing math, right? If we, sometimes, if you, creating cubes is, not, is gonna be pretty fast, uh, but sometimes if you have something that takes a long time to update between each, each iteration, uh, you know, you don't want necessarily wanna do the math and get the same result 10 times a second. And so right here, it just kinda helps keep things tidy uh, if the self that updated. So we calculate progress, make sure it's an int, multiply it by 100, set it to that actual, um, property that we registered, and then set self that updated equals false, just keeping ourselves tidy. Um, and then we check if the thread is actually alive or not, and if it's no longer alive, whether it's returned because it's early, uh, or it's returned because, well actually, up there it will do that. So this is if it actually has finished itself. So once the thread has finished, it's no longer alive, and we'll re this will return that it's not alive, and we can uh, clean up with self.finish and return finish. Now, the last statement here, right, if, nothing, if none of these other, uh, re these two return ones actually fire, right, it's gonna eventually get to return pass through. You can do two things. Pass through allows um, any other events that have triggered it uh, to pass to other things inside Blender. Um, so, but if you don't want it, if you want it, the, the UI to freeze, 
but not freeze in the sense of like it turns white. You want it to freeze in the sense that they can't actually interact with the stuff. That way it, they're not messing things up while it, it, the, the other thread is working. You can actually return um, modal again, uh, running modal again, and it will freeze the actual UI, and it will, uh, but it will update the timer still. So, but if you don't, if you do pass, pass through, it will, it'll let all other clicks and stuff like that go through, and they'll be able to use the user interface like normal. And this is the last little bit here. Everything we've been talking about has actually been inside the, the operator class, except for this header draw function. So if that was confusing, I apologize. I try to include the class and, and then the actual functions inside that class in each one if it was going to do it. So this is self.finish. This just removes the timer. You don't need to remove the, the modal operator. It does that itself when you finish or when you return. Um, and then we're just setting the progress bar to not be displayed. This is the actual thing that displays the, the, the progress bar. It's what we appended to the header in the text file. So. Okay, that is how I have found the best way to do a progress bar is multi-threaded. And it, it works really well you, to most of the time. We use it right now to, to actually install our assets. We have, especially TrueBDB has gigabytes upon gigabytes of assets. Um, and locking a user's computer up where it just goes, at least in Windows, where it goes widescreen is horrible. And most people don't know how to start Blender from the terminal or to do the, the whole console reveal thing, which is another great way to show in a progress bar. But that's not great. And you can't automatically do it. And it's just, so it doesn't work. So this is the best way I have found to, to show the user that you're still doing stuff. And what's nice in that update function in the modal, uh, I'll do a uh, lots of other stuff. I'll do like a timer update. I'll do uh, what, what I'm ex actually working on. So I can, I can report back the cube name that I'm creating or something like that. And it'll show it in the user interface or in our part. It's usually what file we're zipping or unzipping, um, or what, yeah, what zip file or something like that. Um, if you're doing files, threading is, is really mostly the best for actual th uh, uh, file-based operating system, uh, uh, thread-based, or uh, sorry, file system-based uh, work, because what a thread will do is that nor normally, if you write or copy or unzip something from a file, that function waits. It waits and it waits and it waits until that, func until that, that uh, file is unzipped or copied or removed. What threading will able to do is that it will, it'll, it'll do like the decompressing of a, a file or whatever the CPU can do and then pass the rest off to the, uh, the hard drive and then move on to the next one. It won't wait for the hard drive to copy or paste or uh, move things around or, or actually anything. So, so there's a lot of useful things if you're moving files around for some whatever reason inside Blender for your add-on. So um, otherwise, and, and, and usually the, the user interface isn't laggy at all because all the work is actually on the hard drive, not the CPU. Um, so all right. So I've been Zach Easton with TrueVFX. Any questions? All right. Yes, sir. Oh man. Mm -hmm. Well, if you ever use a true add-on, you'll notice that we don't do this either. We don't know, um, but we have some ideas. Uh, yes, GPL is definitely the way it is. It would be really awesome. Uh, we the Blender has been kind enough to give us the GPU, and right now for so for now we saw the GPL or G BGL uh, library uh, for for all of these, uh, for, for accessing the OpenGL thing. But it'd be really nice, and maybe someone has, oh, oh actually, you know what, that JNM guy that I talked about on YouTube, he actually has a, a repository where he has his own kind of version of um, uh, uh, an API for, G, uh, op, uh, what am I trying to say, OpenGL inside Blender, and you can use it, it's free, he, it's, it's open source, um, you can use it, and so I, yeah, you know that JNM guy, that would be a really great guy to go to, uh, or to, to get his repository, and see, and maybe even do updates and stuff like that, because it will auto, it will, it'll, it does, last I looked, he had panels, he had buttons, he had sliders, he had um, sliders, even like where it was like a, a dot on a line and stuff like there's a lots of different stuff that he actually had that was a little bit more easier to, to work with. So I, I check there, see if, if that works with your style and whatnot. So yeah. Um, yes, sir. Sure. So I don't do C++. Um, <laughs> I, I've looked into it actually. So we also do a, an add-on called Nodescapes, and it, which is uh, procedural terrain creation. And you want that thing as fast as possible. Um, and really, it is. It, it, if you're a, if you have to do anything where you constantly do the the BPY access, basically, you're gonna probably need to stick with Python. Um, I've just recently seen, seen some people who are trying to basically they make their own C++ objects, and then you can actually get 
as a pointer many of the, the the properties inside blender and then you i don't know what they do after that i don't know how they know exactly i guess they look at the source code but one thing we've done with uh nodescapes is what we do we get all the data as much as data we as we can from blender right L load into arrays or whatever we do because number or not, not number sorry um Nodescapes is basically just an image, if you think of it. It's a black and white image because it's just height values. And so we get all that, that, that array, we have all the information we need, and then we actually pass it to, I, I, I've, done, I've dabbled a little bit in C because it is faster, and then there's a thing called C types, which you use in order to get it. That's no fine because then you also need to compile upon Windows, um, you need to compile upon uh, Linux and Mac. So there's things called Cython, which I've tried to get to work and I've never been able to do. The, the, what we're currently doing right now in Nodescapes, we just released it because we want wanted to do multi-threading and we wanted to do M1 support. Um, and the easiest way to do that without buying an M1 we found is actually a third-party plugin or third-party um, module called Numba, N-U-M-B-A. I thought about talking about today, but I was like, eh, it's a beginner, I don't know. Um, and so if you're doing a lot of math and you're not actually going into and actually selecting or going and dealing anything with the, in the Blender API necessarily, you can export everything, Numba is good. And so what Numba will do um, is that it, it compiles everything down to uh, a hardware level code as much it, it's as fast as C normally and it's very simple to do so you you write it in Python you add a decorator uh, uh, from Numba and that will then get you it, it automatically compiles it all for you it does a lot and, and with a simple argument to that decorator uh, parallel equals true and then you replace a couple things in the code very simple with with basically Numba's version of that you get multi-threading and then there's a whole other level with it. They, they, they allow you to, to do GPU and not just GPU uh, for NVIDIA. They also have a right now it's beta. It's uh, for uh, uh, AM. What's the other one? What's yeah, No, <laughs> what's what's the other uh, GPU is AMD. Thank you. I kept trying to say AMS and AMU and whatnot. Yeah, AMD. They, they have it's their they're kind of their they have a beta version for that, so it's possible to do that. I we're we're just now looking into that, and so I couldn't give you information about that. But number, if you need to get out of Blender and it's all math based, basically, um, I would and you can and, and know how to do parallel. I would recommend number. Not to give away our secrets, but there's our secrets. All right. Is there any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. I tried, I tried to use it, it didn't work, and then I Googled, and they recommended that Blender you should use Red instead. Did that change? Um, so, like, like you were said, it's the multi processing uh, one that's not supported, but we're using multi threading, which is supported. So, multi processing is actually where you use multiple cores of the CPU. Um, so, like, like my CPU, or like a normal CPU maybe has four or eight cores, but threads, it has twice that amount, right? You have kind of one thread, and it's able to switch back and forth between these threads if one thread is busy. Um, and so threading works, and, and, and it works very uh, all the time. The thing is, again, it's not, you can't, it's not, it's, it's parallel, but it's not parallel. It's kind of like more like they're switching when one is busy. They're switching back and forth. Uh, and which allows you to, that's why I said well, if you're using Blender API uh, for anything or if it's just really laborious, you're going to see stuttering in the UI. Um, and so that's what it is. So it's like you have, a, you have the Blender working in one thread um, and when this one's not doing anything, it'll work on this one. And when this one's paused for a second, it'll switch back and it just, it, it kind of does something like that. And that's how the UI is able to do it while this one still works. Does that make sense? So thread was inside threading. Threading is the Python module. Uh, thread was a class, it basically to create a thread. The one that you're not supposed to use is multi-processing. Does that, uh, does that make sense? So, yeah. Yeah, at least that, that is my experience. It's been fine. And you know, we, I've, I've used this. We, we try to make it compatible back to the re most recent LTS and 2.93 at least. It's been, how about, if, if it wasn't supported in the past, it's at least been supported since 2.93. Okay. Sorry. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We, it's, I'm just now really honestly getting very comfortable with it. And so that is the one that I've really found that's best to do. 
Um, because again, it's not doing, it's not, it's not a background process. You're not doing something on a different core, right? So it's really only useful if you're trying to update something with the user interface and, and that you don't want, uh, you basically it's just anything to report back to the user. Just, it's really, it's user experience more than anything else. Um, so inside actual functions, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to parallelize anything, which is very frustrating because it would be really nice if you could do that inside. But, but Python in general has some difficulties with multiprocessing. Um, co uh, compared to other other uh, ones, other languages. Yes, sir. Is there an example online of a working uh, program? Um, so, uh, mine. Uh, so actually, I totally for almost forgot to say this. This, if you go to this link right here, this GitHub link, uh, the two uh, examples I said are on that. Uh, hopefully, letter for letter. I don't think I changed anything. So, uh, yeah. If you go to, I mean, if here's the actual word link, but then a QR link. If you go there, you actually my, my repository. It only has like four things, so it's not like you're going to scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Two of them are one's the Python uh, library module installing, and the other one is the um, the the progress bar. All right. So hopefully, I hope it should work. If not, it should be pretty simple to fix. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping. If not, hey, contact me. We're, we have a Discord. Uh, my email is zacheaston at gmail.com. Um, and so there's, there's other stuff like that. Uh, you feel free to contact me. I don't mind doing that. Or come find me afterwards. If like, you tried it tonight and you're like, it, you, you suck. It didn't work at all. I'm like, come back and find me tomorrow. I'm like, oh, OK, my bad, a bug. And I can post a, a comment on, underneath this video or something like that. So anything else? We have five minutes. Four minutes, yes. Of course. Um, so if you want to start just starting out with creating an add-on, what is like the change time frame, project size that you would recommend? Yeah, so I've been... I've, yeah, so for those who didn't hear, I should have done this very question. I apologize for those who are viewing it afterwards like myself, and I'm like, what are they asking? What is he answering? She asked basically time, how do you judge time frame for creating a new add-on? That's a really good question. Honestly, we're about to uh, start True Train 5.0, and I, we're, we're giving ourselves six months, but it might be more because we're going to, we're, we're, we, we've, I've, I've, I've uh, advanced as a developer, and so there's a lot more stuff I want to implement and try, and so we'll see. It might be six months, it, and honestly, the best way I know is to, do and then like write down or like you know um, it really it's doing it's doing and timing yourself not to say I time myself I'm very bad about doing that um, but <laughs> yeah not the greatest I, I, I am the greatest you should listen to me but I'm not the greatest you shouldn't listen to me so um, yeah I apologize I don't have a better option than that I just kind of know like it's it depending upon your actual um, development abilities and like how much you know what you don't know compared to the add-on you're creating. Um, so, but I will say, uh, hopefully, if you follow a lot of the advice, especially the VS Code stuff, a lot of the the, the banging your head against a keyboard until it breaks uh, is usually taken away, or at least it's left to trying to find whatever the API for what you're trying to do is. Um, so, yes, sir. Oh, great question. Okay, so what he asks is like, are there add-ons like currently shipped with Blender or maybe even that you buy to actually uh, view and uh, read their code? Um, I, I, yes and no. Like, there's some stuff like we I, I looked and kind of, I mean, it, it really depends. I would say definitely find the add-on that's doing what you want to do, and then read the code. I, I would hope that all developers are totally fine with you doing that um, because we're all trying to lift each other up here, right? I'm giving away our secrets because I'm hoping to lift the Blender community as a, as a whole up and it's like that. So um, like when we were developing Nodescapes, I definitely looked at uh, the Ant landscape add-on and like seeing, okay, like what, what are you doing? How are you finding these things? Because you know, we're, doing, we're doing Matthew Tills for the noise at, at the very, very beginning and it was just so slow. I was like, so is Ant doing this as well? And it turns out they were unfortunately so we did some other workarounds, but um, uh, yeah. So find the add-on that is doing what you're doing, if you can find it, and or doing something similar, and see how they're doing it. Um, and definitely, usually the very popular add-ons are doing some really cool stuff too. Uh, I believe I saw him. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yes. Oh, not yet. So unfortunately, when you become a full-time developer. Like, I feel like I've, I don't mean like, sometimes I forget to even use our add-ons. I'm, I'm using the add-on that I'm currently like building and stuff like that, but uh, anymore right now, we really rely upon um, those using it. Our, our, we have a fantastic user base that we're very grateful for, and we're using it on that. So I, I haven't, I've wanted to like do like the, the, the stable diffusion or dream texture or stuff like that. Oh, for like the actual VS Code, AI for like VS Code, stuff like that. Again, 
wanted to, just haven't like gotten into it and done the free free trial and like that. But I want to. I'd love to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I believe you because it looks cool and people keep and VS Code keeps like I think they bought it now or something like that and now they keep they keep showing events on you. Oh, another thing, if you like VS Code, uh, VS Code has really great videos online uh, on YouTube. Especially, specifically, they've been doing shorts. Fantastic. Very much enjoyable. Sorry. Yes, sir. And that's the last one. I don't think I have a number of time. Yeah. That is a fantastic thing. So for those who didn't hear because he didn't have a microphone, uh, you can all, a lot of, actually all of the UI is written in Python or the Blender Python API. And so what you can do is you can actually right click, open up script file because you have those developer extras add, include, um, added on and actually open up the, the, the script that's doing the API usually, unless it's some very dynamic thing. Um, and you can actually see how they're doing it. Or if you can search sometimes, sometimes there's code like modifiers. I don't think the, 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 the Python API is no longer doing it for the modifiers, but you can find old ones where they were doing it. And so, yeah, finding that, finding old use of Blender API too. So, all right. Thank you all so much. I am so glad you're all here. <laughs>